Welcome to ZCast, everyone. I'm ZS Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here uh, in person at RSA 2024. I'm inside the Commvault stand uh, in the North Expo Hall. It's a massive booth, so uh, it's uh, pretty interesting to see. Uh, I'm joined today by Michelle Bushman from American Pacific Mortgage and uh, Tim Zonka uh, from Commvault. Uh, Tim, I'm going to start with you. Uh, before I get into some okay. questions for you, though, a little, a quick little bio on you. Uh, what you do for Commvault. Uh, and, yeah. uh, so and, uh, I'm Tim Zonka, and I run portfolio marketing here, which combines customer marketing and product marketing. Okay. Now, the company recently introduced a product called Clean Room, hence the clean room that yeah. we're in. Uh, other than it being a cool brand to create this white room, uh, wh what is the Clean Room product? The main thing that Clean Room Recovery does is help people uh, test their cyber recovery. What we found is with our uh, a lot of organizations out there, the delta between recovery plans and their actual ability or at least frequency of doing true operational recovery tests is massive. Yeah, and this I've, helps. This I've always helps said everyone's that. an expert in the planning. Yeah, <laughs> not so much in the recovery yeah. side of things. Yeah. And so a lot of people, you know, you, they'll rely on checklists once a year, maybe that are doing some sort of simulation or tabletop exercise, but actually hitting the speed bumps that you're going to encounter when you do a recovery, it's not happening enough. So it's really on the front end of that backup recovery. Correct. Play. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's GA now? Is it is it? GA, yeah. Okay. For, uh, for the last few months, it's been yeah. GA. As part of this announcement, the big change is um, it's now available to any Commvault Cloud customer, okay. including those that use our SaaS uh, subscription. And any kind of early feedback? Uh, yeah, I think the early feedback is, well, first of all, uh, what the first set was, I've been trying to build something like this for years and we gave up yeah. uh, and you've made this really easy. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is uh, the test, this testing use case is the one that jumped up the first. The second one that's already starting to emerge are people started using it for forensics and in other aspects of the IR process. Okay, great. And now to get a little more feedback on uh, the importance that I'm going to transition to Michelle. I know, Tim, I know you've got a... Uh, you got to jump to something else, right? So yeah. well, thanks for uh, uh, yeah, thanks for yeah. Uh, having me here, and uh, so good to see so you. So we'll wave a, a you. to you, <laughs> and then uh, Michelle. Yes. Uh, when I looked up your bio, you're from American Pacific Mortgage. So uh, first, a little bit on who American Pacific Mortgage is, and um, I saw your title as CISO and CIO, and a bunch of other things which I think is a pretty interesting combination. But first, uh, a bit of background on American Pacific Mortgage. Sure, so um, American Pacific Mortgage is an independent mortgage bank that lends nationally. We basically bring um, the dream of home ownership to consumers. Um, we are a top 10 independent mortgage bank with about 3,000 employees and about 400 locations. Okay, I just got a mortgage, so I should have talked to you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I, I did see your title as CIO, CISO, and a couple other things, which to me is a very interesting combination because in most businesses, those are separate functions, and frankly, they don't often work very well together, right? So talk about that and why APM put those things together and what that means for your role. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, over the last 10 years that I've been with APM, we've obviously grown significantly. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm a little bit more unique of a CIO in that I actually grew up in the operational business side. Um, so I went through my career and learned everything you could know about mortgage operations and then transitioned into technology where I found my passion, particularly in the development side, actually. Yeah. Um, I love to think of new things and see them built and delivered. Um, but I kind of have that unique skill set where I understand um, the business impact. Um, and throughout my career, I've, I've held lots of different positions um, and security was one of those things I was always very interested in. And so it was kind of a natural play, you know, as a, a smaller company early on, generally they can't afford to have a CIO, a CTO, and a CISO. Um, so you and, just did them all? Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's it's helpful in a way in that I'm able to bring those teams together so there isn't as much conflict. My cybersecurity analyst actually <laughs> participates in the daily scrums with the engineering team, although they report direct, you know, he reports directly to me. Um, but I've had this question a lot. It's like, yeah. you know, I want to be innovative as the CIO and do stuff, but then, you know, what about the security? And it always comes down to the security has to be first. Yeah, well, you've got three hats on, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, that's interesting. So we're going to be talking about cyber resilience, uh, obviously. Uh, and um, so the interesting thing about the way you've combined your roles is when I think of cyber resilience, that isn't really a CISO role, nor is it a CI role. It is a combination of both. And so uh, when you... When you think about that, that part of your responsibility, um, uh, I'm assuming the way you've structured the role actually helps with that, especially 
understanding the operational impact of what you're doing. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, again, one of the unique things, and it's, it's kind of funny, I've had this argument with a lot of people. I, I ended up owning both, you know, disaster recovery and business continuity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, risk needs to own that. You know, I'm more on the IT side, but because of that business knowledge, I think they felt that it was a good place to put me in, in charge of both. Um, but what's interesting is over the last 10 years, if you think about it well, from a CIO perspective, even, Disaster recovery has changed. It's not yeah. the same, right? Disaster recovery, uh, you know, the likelihood, it's, you know, it, it can happen depending on where you are in the country, you know, hurricane or, you know, earthquake in California. Um, but, you know, that's really just set, you know, making sure you have a secondary place to continue business with cyber resiliency, very different. Um, it can take everything you have down, even your secondary environment if they get in the wrong way. So you really need to have a different strategy um, and you, you need to be able to do it quick uh, because, you know, I've seen with some of my peers, it can hold you down for a really long time, yeah. um, you know, especially like ransomware, which is very common, right? The amount of time it takes to verify your backups are clean, um, get a new environment, make sure the environment's clean, you know, um, and then if you can't do that and you're paying the ransom, by the time you decrypt all the data, and in our world, major data sets, right, you know, a lot of documentation and information, you know, it could take you weeks to actually get back yeah. into an operating state. And the dirty little secret, I guess it's not such a secret with ransomware, is once you hit, you're going to get hit again. And just because you pay the ransom, you're not necessarily going to get the data back. As yep, well. yep. Yeah, and they still may release it too out to yeah. out to the public, which is a challenge. Yeah, and so I know you're looking at Clean Room, and I'm, I'm curious uh, as to what you've seen about it. What excites you about it? Um, I think we're a uh, metallic customer, so we're already um, getting a great level of protection from Commvault directly. Um, but what I really liked about this one is, you know, we do our testing once a year for BCP and DR, right? And I'm always doing it with some sort of backups to see how quickly I can get an application up and running or recover data, particularly file shares because they're monsters, right? Um, what I love about the solution is that I can do that quarterly now because it's a matter of a click of a few buttons and you know in 20 minutes it's done um, and then if it does fail I can retest it pretty quick it's yeah. not like it's gonna take my small team weeks you know to keep doing this over and over and so that I can sleep better at night knowing that hey my backups are good um, we can recover we know how long it takes and we have a place that you know we can put those backups to really validate to make sure that they haven't been touched you know with the immutable capabilities Capabilities that Convault has. Yeah, and the current relationship you have with Convault, uh, what led you to that? Was that a uh, was that on the cyber side, or was that more an IT function that uh, brought you into the Convault fold initially? Yeah, so um, we did a huge RFP several years ago, looking across the landscape, um, and you know one of the one of the first things I will say reputation. You know, reputation of Commvault of being able to recover data from large organizations made me very comfortable with you that, you know, we could use their solution. Um, we did start with the original on-prem product. Um, I do run a fairly small team, and so I'm always looking for ways that I can offset some of the labor. And so when, when our renewal came up, uh, Metallic was just coming out, and um, I'm very cloud first just because of, I have a yeah. small team. And so we looked into it, um, you know, we went through the implementation, and it's been great. Um, you know, get ready to tape backups, you know, um, not needing on-prem equipment, um, and the ease of use for the team running the backups has been pretty pretty significant. Yeah, in this space in particular, there's a lot of debate. Do I do cloud, do I do on-prem? A lot of people think that if I'm in the cloud, I might be at risk with privacy or things. Does that concern you at all? Um, well, we always do our due diligence. Yeah. You know, when we're looking at a vendor, particularly because I do house a lot of NPI and PII data, I need to make sure my vendors that I'm working with um, have the right certifications. Um, you know, so we go through a very deep due diligence. Um, but again, I'll, I'll kind of go back that this this is Commvault's business. This is what they ex, they're experts at, and this is what they do every day. Yeah. My team is doing 50 different things. So the the reality of am I safer if I manage it myself versus having someone else doesn't doesn't click with me. I think I'm actually safer going to a vendor who has more resources and expertise in that area. Yeah, actually, I'm glad you said that because I find it funny when people say that uh, the cloud's not secure. And my, you know, look, the, most of the companies that use the cloud have far better security pro, uh, best practices than most enterprises do. So uh, I think it's uh, it's counterintuitive to a lot of people think, but I think it's it's reality. So yeah. yeah. Now you you uh, and so how long have you been a Commvault customer? 
oh gosh, I want to say probably about seven years, I think. And have you had to, can you give an example where you had to put it into action and how quickly you were able to recover? Yeah, so luckily enough, we've never had to really go to backups to recover things. But what I can tell you is we do have a lot of data and documents, right? And so um, we have a group, our capital markets group, um, and what they do every day is critical to our business. They're, you know, managing our hedging position, which could basically put you out of business if they don't have the data they need to make sure we're in the right position in the market. And so they unfortunately still are using Excel pretty heavily, um, working on that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, sometimes they've deleted a file or it gets corrupted because it's a monster file with a lot of data, a lot of macros. And we're able to go back and recover that file through that backup system super fast. Um, our previous backup system, we couldn't do it at a file level. We had to do the whole restoration. Oh. And so it would take hours, sometimes longer, to be able to recover that. So well, and then the users matters. know that and they would give up probably, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. So, you know, just the speed at which we can actually get a file back. And I can't tell you, how appreciative the, our customer, our, our users are when they get it because a lot of times that you're losing all that data if you have to recreate it. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the world of iCloud and consumer tech has made us, got us to the point where we think we should be able to find that immediately because we can, you know, you delete a photo, you go to iCloud, you get it, right? Right. And then in the corporate world, you ask your IT department to recover a file and it's next week that you get it back. Yeah. So you, <laughs> yeah. Now you are in a very heavily regulated industry. There's uh, been some recent security regulation changes, things like that. How's that changed your approach? Um, or have you had to adapt what you're doing? Uh, not particularly. Uh, when I first joined American Pacific Mortgage, we are an independent mortgage bank. So we're not an actual banking institution that would be um, regulated by like FDIC or FFIC. Our regulator is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB. Um, and, but I'm a big believer when I walked in the door at APM that we have as much data as a bank on our consumers and we have to up our game from a security perspective to be like a Bank of America because I have that kind of data to secure. So actually when I walked in the door, we had a very immature um, IT department. I would say security wasn't really present, yeah. <laughs> which is not uncommon in our industry. And you know, we're talking years ago. Um, and so for me, I've always been about getting the security in place, getting the procedures in place. And I've actually really enjoyed building our security program over the last 10 years at APM. Um, it's, it's been so insightful. I've learned so much. Um, and I think that's one of the things I love about being in IT is I'm always learning something new. Yeah. Again, now I want to pivot a little bit and talk about ransomware. Uh, every report I read, every data point I see, there has been this massive uh, uptick in ransomware. And it's getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, I think the Welcome. threat actors are able to just go directly through users because phishing's gotten so advanced, right? And so how has this rise in ransomware changed the way you think about the intersection of cyber and data resilience and backup? Well, it's, you know, I, I take the approach, it's not if, but when. Yeah. Um, so we have to be ready. Uh, we have to know what we need to do and, um, you know, have our plans built out. Um, you know, I even work with our cyber insurance company to do tabletop exercise so that we know who does what, so we don't violate our policies. Um, but it, you have to be thinking it's gonna happen. Um, and then I'm a big believer, and I'm sure a lot of people are, our biggest risk is our people. And so um, I have been, you know, hot on the trail actually for 10 years at our, our company, changing the perspective of IT as a partner, not the cop. Um, and, you know, really encouraging people, don't try to do something outside of policy, but come and talk to us so we can find a safe way for you to do your work. Um, but really educating our folks. I mean, it, it has to be from the top down as well. And so I've been very lucky, our C-suite, um, they do a lot of video communications. And so they're always talking about it. Um, and it's actually been very easy to talk about it this year. Because if you look in the news last year of how many um, financial services, mortgage yeah. servicers, You don't want to be on that list. No, I do not want to be on that list. <laughs> Um, so, you know, at a board level as well as an executive level, um, they understand the, you know, severity of it um, and they're willing to help support me to make sure we have the right tools and things in process to support the business in the event when it happens. Hopefully yeah. it never does, but, you know, I'd have to yeah. think that it will. <laughs> and, and how's APM thinking about just the role of technology in general? Obviously, in the industry you're in, there's a lot of trust that has to be built up with your customers. Has that been something the company has been able to use 
as a way to differentiate itself within your customers to uh, establish a certain level of trust that they, you know, maybe they wouldn't have had a few years ago. Yeah, no, um, you know, interestingly enough, I've noticed over probably the last five years is I get a lot more calls from our loan officers where they have a consumer that wants to know, how are you protecting my data? And, you know, really asking the question, which I love to see because you know, we still get the consumer sending their personal files over email unsecure, yeah. which, you know, that's the worst ever. Um, so one of the things that's on my roadmap, uh, when time permits, because, you know, whoever has enough time, is actually building out a consumer education program that I'm going to train my loan officers on so that when they engage with a consumer, when they're starting the process of a loan, that they, you know, have a one or two pager, hey, here's how we work, here's how I want you to send me your information, here's why, these are the things to look out for. Um, what we have done at least and I'd say probably about seven years ago um, we actually put a disclosure in our initial disclosure package and that's the package when a person decides to move forward with the loan they get you know all this paperwork um, and one of the disclosures in there talks about wire fraud um, that is the one area I can't protect the consumer from yeah. from a technical perspective but it impacts our reputation and just to make think about it um, you know you've got a borrower it's coming to buy their first home they get taken they, 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 you know, get that wire to escrow that they're thinking to close their transaction and their money's gone. Yeah. Um, it that is, is terrible, you know, and, you know, luckily enough at APM, we help facilitate to make sure they still close that loan. Um, and that's just because that's how we take care of our customers. But that trust is so important. Um, and I'm a big believer that businesses do need to educate their customers more as well, because if they aren't getting it in their um, employment world, they may not be getting that at all. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's interesting though too because if you look at the different age ranges too, um, and their level of trust of technology, it's very different too. Yeah, certainly the younger employees. In fact, there's a lot of shareware apps where you. I've seen things where you put all your financial info into an app, <laughs> and then it'll tell you how to manage your credit better and things. And yeah. but you're giving up a lot of information on yourself yeah. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so just la uh, last topic here. Uh, obviously, at RSA, one of the big topics this year is Gen AI. Right? You can't really talk to anybody. That. And so, when you think about how Gen AI could be used in an organization like yours, it's possible people could take sensitive data, throw it into chat GPT, ask some questions, right? So, yeah. what's your policy on Gen AI and then how are you, since you're the, the, uh, the it sounds like the IT department of yes, how are you helping users facilitate the use of that without putting your customers' data at risk. Yeah, no, um, funny story is obviously, I would say probably late last year, um, you know, I got the business coming to me. We have a product that we use for our chatbot and they've integrated um, an open, a API, uh, open AI API into their product. Um, and they're like, we need to turn this on, you know, um, you know, we're short staffed, we need to do a better job of responding to our customers and in a nicer way, instead of like two, two words or one sentence, you know, being able to actually respond in a nice customer friendly way. And I'm like, okay, not yet. I go, I'm 110% with you. We have to adopt these technologies. If we don't, we'll be left behind and they really will provide um, operational efficiency, um, which can reduce costs for our organization and improve customer experience if you do it right. So, you know, the first thing I did was, okay, I need to learn more about this stuff, right? So I, I started digging in, trying to understand how it works, what it did. Um, I leveraged some of my network to say, okay, what questions am I missing? So met with the vendor, with their legal, with their you know product teams, and surprisingly, they did a really good job of giving me the controls um, within the application, so I felt comfortable that I had control of it. Um, then I worked on, I built a policy, and I built a training program, um, and then we piloted it, and the way we're doing it is kind of like um, a wingman, I would say, right, to help our agents answer questions. Um, and so we went through and basically what's really important is that your end user understands there's great power and it's great efficiency, but you got to trust but verify. Um, and so the way I did that was actually showing them, putting information into Bar Google, Bard, and um, uh, OpenAI, right? And said, tell me where APM is located, like from a corporate perspective, and they were wrong. And then we said, when we were founded, and it was wrong, right? Yeah. So giving them a real life example of how you can get bad data back Welcome. really opened their eyes. They had great questions. Um, so we've adopted that and it's been huge. 
Um, so the from the experience side, I want to do more of that in IT um, and then really start using it to automate some of the IT functions that maybe like you would have a tier three engineer needs to do. You can have a tier three engineer through AI that guides a tier one or two to get the problem fixed or even better yet, if it's seen the issue before, have it go and fix it itself. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's uh, uh, It sounds like you've really embraced the whole concept of IT being a partner to the business though. And so uh, just one last question for, uh, you know, anyone watching this who's on the IT side, there's a lot of talk about IT needs to partner with the business, but a lot of people don't really know how to start that, right? What kind of advice would you give uh, people watching this on uh, how to facilitate that and how to be that true partner to the business? Yeah, be curious. Be curious about the business. Learn about the business. You need to actually understand the business to show where you can give value, where you can reduce risk. Um, and, you know, spend time with them. Go, you know, I, I have a weekly meeting with my production team so that I can actually say, okay, what are the problems? What are the challenges you're having? What are our customers hearing? Um, one of the best things our uh, president recently did is he took a one of our production gentlemen and he's the director of our production technology and he partners with me so that I can get a perspective from the origination side, which is the bulk of our customers, right? We, we mostly work with our originators and they're working with the consumer um, to really understand how our decisions and the choices we make impact their ability to deliver a great product that's useful to our sales force. Um, but you would never get that insight unless you're spending time with them. Yeah. And, you know, and just be open to it. Um, and one of the things, like if you were to ask one of my engineers on my team, I think one of the best things they think that I brought to them is the understanding of acceptable business risk. Because you talk to your security team, they want to lock everything down immediately, right? If you did that, your business couldn't function. And I always tease them, you'll have pitchforks um, and torches right outside our offices, yeah. right? And um, they, 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 they've started to understand. It's like, yeah, I understand we have that gap, but let's look at it from a risk perspective. And then the most important thing is just making sure your C-suite and your board understands that those risks exist. Um, but, you know, really, if you don't know your, if you don't know the business that you are running IT for, you don't really know where your risks are. Yeah, well, that's, that's great advice then. Yeah, all right, Michelle, well, uh, thanks for the little tutorial on what you're doing with Commvault, how you're managing cyber resilience, and uh, I, I think most importantly for the audience is, how you actually be a partner with the business. It seems like you know, IT pros I talk to all the time have trouble getting projects uh, approved, but if I suppose if you can't really talk about it in terms of the business, then that's, that's going to be one of the challenges. Yeah, so, you yeah. have to be able to relate yeah. to the business to show yeah. them where the value yeah. comes into them, or if it's truly like a reduction in risk, you know, how do we reduce that yeah. risk? Um, what is that risk? And sometimes that's tough, yeah. um, especially around cyber to really identify how do I explain if this happens, what does that mean? Because um, that's sometimes even a challenge for me to try and get it across to the board to say, hey, you know, getting them to understand it from my seat. And I think that's the challenge. Um, technical and business language is very different. Um, you know, so you, you just got to try to understand their perspective. And, I, you know, a plug. The, the other day, one of the sessions I attended was storytelling. Yeah. If you haven't done something like that, do it because it's really going to help you understand what your audience, you know, how to approach your audience. Um, and it'll make a difference because they'll get engaged in here because I'm sure I'm not alone. A lot of times when IT is talking, uh, you get about 10 minutes and then everybody is on their phone or because the, they're just not interested, yeah. right? Unless it's something super cool, they're not interested in the boring stuff, which is a lot of the important stuff. Yeah, so. uh, the importance of storytelling. So that's good advice. Yeah. All right, Michelle, well, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, from the Commvault booth at RSA, on behalf of Michelle Bushman from American Pacific Mortgage and Tim Zonka, who's no longer with us, uh, <laughs> I'm Zia Scaravall from CK Reaches. Thanks for watching. Please hit the subscribe button. I'll see you next time on my next episode of Zcast. Mm -hmm.